Welcome to Renew Church. We're here for the kickoff, fall 2017. We're glad that you can make it. We're starting with a new series this fall talking about church. It's called Why Church? And so we're glad that you joined us here today. You know, once upon a time in Canada, people went to church. If you go back and look at the statistics, in fact, weekly attendance at religious services in Canada went from around 50% in the mid-60s to about 10% in 2015. Now, that is all religious services. That includes mosques, temples, gurdwaras, synagogues, whatever. That also includes Catholics and Protestants. So when you really think about the number of Canadians in a Christian contemporary Bible-centered church like ours on any given Sunday, it's very small. We're probably talking somewhere around 2 to 3% of the population here in the GTA. So the fact that you are here today sitting in a church probably means one of a few things. Um, first of all, it could mean that you're just one of those people who does what you're told and doesn't ask a lot of questions, right? Like, you grew up going to church, your parents told you to go to church, and so you say, okay, that's what I do, I go to church, and you've continued that habit. So maybe that's your case. Um, maybe you're here today because you're a person who is just really, really desperate, right? Like, everything in your life's going wrong. Your finances are a mess, your relationships are all broken, everything's going poorly. You're out of a job. Um, maybe even on your way here this morning, your dog puked on your shoes. Like everything is going wrong for you. And so you're like, I'm going to go to church because I'm really desperate. That could be your case. But then it could be a third category, and that is that you're somebody that just appreciates church for reasons that a lot of people don't understand. They just don't get it, but you do for whatever reason you get it. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Most people today in our society, they don't get church. They don't get it. They don't understand what it's all for and what it's all about. Years ago, it was kind of an expectation. It was a cultural norm. People went to church. If you didn't show up at church on Sunday, people said, hey, where were you? You should have been at church. Uh, but today, people really feel that they have a choice. And most people, when you look around, are choosing to use their time and energy for other things. They're investing it elsewhere. You can hear the rationale from a lot of different people. You know, if you go and check out uh, atheists, for example, you could hear Richard Dawkins explain all of the reasons why church is a ridiculous concept, um, why you don't want to be wasting your time there. You could listen to cynics, people like Bill Maher, who would say, you know, why would you ever go to church? What's the point of that? Um, even comedians that are very funny, honestly, in the way that they talk about this subject, guys like Bill Burr or George Carlin, you know, they're very funny and they'll give you some pretty good insight into why people don't go to church. Um, it just doesn't make sense to a lot of people. And even Christians, people that maybe grew up going to church, you can go online and read a lot of stories, a lot of articles of people that are going to say things like, hey, I used to go to church, why I gave up on church. You can find these all over the place. Even people that maybe were involved in ministry, why I left the church. So maybe you're one of those people today that just doesn't get church, and you're part of a big group of people. I just want you to know that you're not the exception. A lot of people don't get church. Why get up on a Sunday morning? Why do this? Why are you here today? You know, why pray? Why do we get together to talk to the invisible man? Like, is this really something we should be doing? Why read the, this ancient book, the Bible, that we get together and, and study? What's up with that? Why give your money to a church? Why listen to that guy preaching on Sunday morning? Like, wow, really, there's nothing better that I could be doing than listening to this guy? Especially only hearing about the things that you're doing wrong, right? I, I get up on Sunday and not only do I do all these things, I go and hear about all the stuff that I'm doing wrong in my life. And people at the end of the line, they're just saying, why church? Why would I do this? What you don't get to hear very often is a reasoned, thoughtful explanation of why some people absolutely love church and are committed to it. Because the truth is, amidst a lot of bleak statistics, there are a lot of people that really love church, and there are a lot of churches that are really thriving. Many churches are expanding, even starting new congregations. For example, here at Renew Church, we just started the new campus in Mayfield um, this past fall, um, just celebrating our first year anniversary in Mayfield. It's fantastic. Things are going really well. People are coming out. People that have never gone to church before and are having a great experience saying, this is awesome, I really value this, um, and this is happening. Next fall, we plan to launch a new campus in Cambridge. Eric and Austin Jensen have joined us 
and uh, they're ready to get going with the team that we have out there in Cambridge. And I can tell you with confidence, the majority of people who attend Renew Church, the majority, they get it. They really understand what church is for, and they value it. It's something that's really deep in their hearts. So thanks for joining us for this series. Whether it's live or online that you're joining us today, thank you for being here to take this in. Over the next five weeks, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to prevent... Per, present to you five compelling reasons for why church. Five very compelling reasons. And if you stick around, I'm confident that you're going to have some reconsidering to do at the end of those five weeks. Not because I've poured some big load of guilt on you and you've said, oh, now I've got to feel like I've got to go to church. No, but because you're going to catch a vision for what church really is all about, what the purpose of it really is, and a passion for it that many of us already share. And I'm really convinced as you come out and hang out with a lot of great people, by the way, here at Renew Church, whatever campus you're at, you're going to meet some great people. You're going to have a chance to really consider the value of church in a new way. So let's do it. Let's get into it. Here we go. Why church? Reason number one, this week we're going to be talking about, I need to orient my life around the main thing. This is what I need to do in my life. And for people that feel this need, church is going to meet something of that need. Now I'm going to spend a good amount of time this morning talking about this main thing concept, and then we're going to come back later and talk about um, how this relates to why church. So just track with me for a little bit, and we're going to talk about this main thing concept. First of all, everyone orients around something. You have to acknowledge this. Everyone is orienting their life around something. So let's begin today by highlighting some very obvious facts. The first obvious fact is that you are not the center of the universe. You're not. Uh, The earth was doing just fine before you got here, and we assume that it's going to continue on after you're gone. You are not the center of the universe. But here's the thing. You have to decide if there is a center of the universe. In other words, is there a being, a narrative, a unifying principle that makes sense of it? And deciding yes or no, whichever way you go on that, both of them require a leap of faith. Neither of them can be proven outright, and so both require a leap of faith. Whichever way you decide, yes or no, there is this central unifying principle, um, you are going to have to live out of that belief. You're going to live out of it, whatever you choose. And not making a decision, just in case you were thinking about just saying, well, I'm just not going to decide. Not making a decision is basically saying there isn't a main thing that I have to orient my life around. Here's the next thing. You can only live purposefully to the degree that the universe is purposeful. This is just a basic philosophical truth. If the universe is truly random, then there really is no real purpose or meaning. The best that we could do is to create some kind of an illusion for ourselves of meaning in the time that we are here. And so if you're here this morning, I'm assuming that you are open to the idea, at least, of there being some kind of a main thing to orient your life around. Otherwise, why would you be here in church in the first place? What social scientists have discovered is that people feel the need to orient themselves around something that's bigger than themselves, something more important, more valuable, something that makes sense of their existence. You probably don't need a social scientist to convince you of this fact. I mean, just look around and then even look inside at your own heart and you recognize you feel this need to orient around something. Let me explain what I mean by orienting your life. By orienting your life, we mean, you know, what do you organize around? What's the big stuff that you kind of prioritize and everything else, you know, works around it? What do you prioritize? What shapes your values in your life? What decides what's important and what's not? What do you give your time to? What do you give most of your energy to? What do you give your money to? What do you, what are you quick to spend money on? That'll, that'll tell you what you're orienting around. And what do you rest your hopes on? When you put your head down on the pillow at night, what is it that gives you that peace and that confidence? You know, we do lots of things in our lives, but that's a different thing than orienting your life around something. Orienting your life is something much more. Let me give you a a quick example. Uh, I like to coach hockey. I've played hockey all my life. I've been coaching for quite a long time, and I'm coaching again this year, my son and uh, the kids his age in Bantam. And I can tell you from experience, when it comes to hockey, There are some parents who play hockey and their kids get involved in hockey and there are others that really orient their entire life around hockey. And when you see it, you definitely recognize the difference. Um, You know, they're giving all kinds of time and energy and all of their planning goes around it. 
Um, and obviously there are degrees there, but you can tell the difference between someone who's just playing hockey and someone who's orienting their life around it. You know, once something becomes the center of your life, you start to depend on that thing to provide for your fundamental human needs. And that just makes sense, because if you're giving all of this time and energy to something, you know, you have to be getting something back from that. You don't have time or energy going somewhere else. It has to be giving you something. And so, for example, I can only give time and energy to hockey in accordance with what I feel it's bringing back to me. Think about that. If it's only bringing me exercise, well, I'll give a minimal investment to it, right? I'll go to the gym even a couple of times a week, so exercise is worth something, so that would be a minimal investment. But I'll give more value to hockey if it gives me time with people I love, time with my son, for example, good father-son time. And I'll give even more time to it if I find my identity in it. If I start considering myself, I am a hockey coach, I am a hockey player, um, and here's another level, I feel the need to win, right? If I get my identity from this, wow, now I'm starting to invest more and orient my life more around this. And the highest level probably comes when we start to actually build our hopes and our dreams around it. This is the parent that says, my son's going to make the NHL, right? You've met these parents before. And for these people, there's no limit to what they will do and what they will give because they've totally oriented their life around it. Now, this is just an example but it's to say everyone orients around something. And you probably have different activities that you can relate to even in that example. It may be a sport, it may be an activity, a hobby, a social group, it could be my own desires, it could be a substance, a person, a religion or philosophy, it could be control. Some people spend their whole life just trying to control life. This is what they orient their whole life around, staying in control. It could be money, it could be fame. I want you to take some time this morning and really think about what is it that you naturally tend toward in orienting your life around. Think about that. We're going to take a little break, and we'll come back and talk about this some more.